Hello and welcome to this rather unusual book launch. Our politicians keep telling us about the new normal and digital book launches look like being a part of that, for the time being at least. I must admit I'd rather be sitting in a cosy bookshop somewhere with a live audience and a bunch of books beside me all ready to sign. But that certainly doesn't mean I don't appreciate talking to you wherever you might be at this moment in time. So a huge thank you for joining me this evening here on YouTube. A huge thank you also to my old friend and television compatriot Richard Else, who kindly agreed to read my new book, Come By The Hills, and asked me a few questions about it. Richard and I worked together on various television projects for 25 years, projects like The Edge, 100 Years of Scottish Mountaineering, Wilderness Walks, The Adventure Show and Roads Less Travelled and, and various other television projects. He shares with me a, a love of adventure and of course the Scottish hills and wild places and he's a neighbour of mine here in Badenoch in the Scottish Highlands. Richard and I had a, a wee stroll the other day by the shores of Loch Inge where we enjoyed a bit of a blether about the book. So without further ado, let me put you into the very capable hands of Richard Else. Cameron, this is a really very different book from your first one that you produced, which was very much autobiographical, your story from a lad in Govan to Scotland's best-known outdoor writer. Um, what motivated this new book? <laughs> the fact that I was getting older and I still had a whole host of memories and things. You know, there are two kinds of people in this world, Richard. Those who can go out and have an experience on a mountain or, or, or on a mountain bike or in a canoe or whatever and go home and be satisfied with that experience. But there's another kind of person who um, goes home and has to tell everybody about it. And I fall into that category. And I think most writers do. Um, they have a great experience and they want to share it with the world. And, and I wrote my first book and I was kind of limited to 300 and odd pages, but you know, there are thousands of pages worth of memories still there. So I thought I'd look at this book from, from the perspective of um, older age, if you like, uh, as someone who can't quite do what I used to be able to do but I'm still desperate to get out there and do things. I have to be really careful with my words now, because if I say it's a late life book, it sounds like you might not be with us much longer, <laughs> which we certainly don't want. But it, as you say, it's a book written in later life. I know you're not a fan of Wainwright, but he wrote two books very late in life that were actually quite full of bitterness and regret. Your book isn't like that. I mean, that must have been quite a, a difficult line to tread, I think. I think this is a joyous book. Well, yeah, but, you know, Wayne Wright and I, I mean, I know you, your chief claim to fame is you've been television directors, the two of the great curmudgeons of, of the outdoor life, Wayne Wright and myself. Um, I, perhaps he had reason to be bitter. I don't. I've had a wonderful career. I've had a wonderful life. Um, you know, looking back on the things that I've done, uh, the, the, there's nothing really but, but joyous memory. So maybe that's what's come across and, and, and a lack of bitterness. I don't have much bitterness. Obviously there are things that have happened in, in my life that, um, that, that might have changed. But, you know, you, we, we, don't, we don't have the facility to do that. We can't go and change things in the past. So we have to look to the future um, and take from the past what we have enjoyed and achieved and, um, and, 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 you know, and try and make that the future as well. And you have a lifelong love affair with the hills. I think everybody knows that. But why the hills? Why not ski mountaineering, biking, sailing, swimming? Yes, well, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've done a bit of all of that. You know, I've, I've, I've done it all. But it's the hills that really speak to me, Richard. It's the hills that make me happy. You know, people quite often say to me, you know, what is it about the mountains that, you know, that attract you so much? And, and, and I can come up with all sorts of philosophical answers. You know, a great one is, you know, I climbed Everest because it is there. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but my, my reason is very simple. I go into mountains and I kind of forget the woes of the world 
moan particular woes at the time. I can go there and forget. And the, the title of the book, I think, sums it up. Come by the hills. It's an old, uh, it's actually not an old folk song. It's a, it's a fairly contemporary song. But, but the words say, um, come by the hills to a land where fancy is free. And I quite like that. You go to the hills and, you know, you, you kind of live perhaps in a, a fanciful world when you're out there. Um, but the, 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 the last words in the chorus um, talk about um, the days of tomorrow, the, the, the cares of tomorrow can wait till this day is done. When you're out on the hill, your focus is on what you're doing. Your focus is on the beauty around you, the wildlife or whatever. And whatever's coming along tomorrow, whether it might be mortgage repayments or problems at work, that can wait. That can wait until you've come down off the hill and gone back home again. So in a sense, there's a bit of escapism in the hills. But to go back to your original question, as, as I get older, I find I'm, I'm doing more of these other things. I can't do what I used to do in the hills. I can't go out and have 20 mile long romps around numerous Monroe tops. So I have to adapt a wee bit and I've learned to adapt. And I now cycle most days and I get a lot from that. Um, I go off in my camper van with my bike in the back, my hiking boots inside and a pack raft in case I want to go on a river or, 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 or on a loch. So there is that adaptability and in that adaptability, I'm discovering new things. I'm discovering new places. And, and, you know, that's got to be a good thing. Now, let's go back 50 years to when you were just end of your teenage years. You are obviously pretty ambitious then because you were a long jump champion. Did the hills always speak to you at that age or did it come later over time? I think it's fair to say that the, the hills took over a major passion of mine, which was long jumping, which was athletics. I was very involved in athletics until I was around about 20, early 20s. I had gone to the hills as a youngster. I, I, I first went to the hills as a 13 year old. Um, and even before then, I would look at some of these places when I went away for weekends with my, with my parents. And um, there was something about the hills and the wild places that touched me in here. And I remember, it's a story I've, 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 I've told so often. And we were in Glencoe and my dad had a, a little new Ford Anglia car. And we were having a, a bit of a picnic. And I saw these two guys come down from the mountains and they come down towards the car park. And I met, to this day, I can remember them so clearly. They both wore tartan plaid shirts and breeches and their socks were down at their ankles. They were bronzed. One of them carried a rope over his shoulder. And to my young eyes, they looked like gods coming down from Parnassus. And I thought, look, look at these guys. They're the epitome of, of, of fitness and something else. And I didn't quite know what it was. And where have they come from? What's up there? What lies up there? And, and I think that really sort of started off this passion for peeping over horizons and just seeing what's beyond. Um, so yes, from a very early age, but it wasn't until I stopped being so involved in athletics that, um, you know, to be fair, I probably needed something else to fill my life. Uh, and the hills actually you know, took place of, of, of athletics in, in a huge way. And just picking up from that, I think the book's very optimistic in tone, but I do sense a loss. I mean, when I first got to know you, multi-day backpacking trips were one of the things you really loved you live for that, really. Yeah, very much so. And it, you know, over, over the past number of years, um, I've, I've suffered from various degenerative issues. That really just means old age. <laughs> and, and I can't do what I used to do. And there's even been several times where I've thought of, I'm going to have to give up the hills. And there's been a couple of occasions where I've gone into the Cairngorms here um, and I've had a pretty good day, but it's hurt me. You know, it's hurt a lot. I've had, problems with my feet and various things. And I've staggered down the hill, um, kind of really worried whether I would make it back to the car or not. And I've thought, this is probably my last day on the hills. But with a decision like that comes a great sense of loss, a sense of bereavement. And I found myself grieving for the mountains and going off and stumbling around again. Um, but you know, thanks to doctors and, and m medicines, I can still get to the hills and I can still wander about, but, but nothing 
to what it used to be. So there's that huge sense of loss um, in not being able to do what I did once. And I think that maybe comes over in the book. I, I haven't written it deliberately like that, but I think it, it comes out naturally. Yeah, I think it does. And I think there's also a really carefully crafted balance in the book. On the one hand, you talk about people who've inspired you, like the naturalist, the late Dick Balhari. You've talked about Nan Shepherd. But also, you put in a collection of walking routes that would last most people a lifetime. That, that, that strikes me as a really difficult balance to achieve. And I think you pulled it off really well. Well, that's very kind of you to say so. I, I appreciate that. I think what... Um, Probably the sort of main part of the book is 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 what Nan Shepherd once said that um, summits are not actually that important, and it's quite interesting when she wrote that, um, probably in the 1940s. Not so many people were going to the summits. I think at that time I'm correct in saying there's only about 15 people had climbed all the Monroes. Um, so that makes it quite interesting. So her, her kind of sense of going to the hills was not about summit bagging, but it's about going and losing herself in the mountain. And when I read that, you know, after reading The Living Mountain, her great book, numerous times, that kind of s stuck out quite, quite a lot. And I thought, yeah, there's something in that. And I remember taking a, an expedition um, to Breirich, where I didn't actually climb the mountain, but I spent three days actually circumnavigating the mountain, going in and out all the quarries. And I probably got as much from that as I did from, you know, climbing up and touching the summit and coming back down again. And when I think back on all the mountain experiences I've had here in the Himalayas or in the Alps or whatever, touching a summit is not the main memory that I have. It's not the overriding memory of these occasions. It's maybe reaching a ridge that, that goes up to the summit. It's maybe seeing a, a golden eagle. It's maybe seeing a wonderful sunset, but it's not really touching the cairn. That'll come as a surprise to a lot of people, I think, because certainly, say, 20 years or so ago, you'd be thought of as a Munro bagger. Your name was, you know, intimately associated with the Munro. Yeah, and, and, and I think I have to be careful that people don't think I'm knocking Monroe Baggett. I'm not. I've, I've climbed the damn things three times. I've written two books about Monroes. And I've got to be very careful that, that people don't get the impression I'm knocking Monroe Bagging. I'm not doing that at all. Uh, far from it. I would encourage anybody with an interest in the hills to take up Monroe Bagging because everybody I know who's climbed all the Monroes has become a, a competent, well-rounded mountaineer. You have to be. So I think it's a great thing. Um, but, but you, know, you reach a point when you realise there are other things to do with mountains. You know, there's mountain culture, there's the botany, there's the bird life, there's all these other things. And these are things that I've been um, discovering you know, over the past 20 years or so. And we have a rich cultural heritage in our mountains. And it used to be that people would sit round the, 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 the fire in the Black House and tell each other stories of of, you know, of, of the hills and the mountains and wild places. We don't do that anymore. So hopefully a book like this will keep some of these stories alive. Um, you know, a bit like the story of Ossian's cave in Glencoe, that um, Ossian's father, Finn McCool, met his wife, uh, but, that, but she was half woman, half red deer. Um, and, it, you know, these, to me, these stories are important. It's our Celtic heritage. It's important to keep them alive and I hope that th you know through the medium of this book I might help to keep some of those stories going. And, uh, yeah I was going to come on to that because t for you a hill isn't a hill. It's the folklore, it's the culture, it it's the history. When did that happen? At what point, I mean I know you're a bit of a folky so it's not entirely a surprise but at some point in your life you must have realised there was more to it than that thing that we probably all have in our late teens, early 20s, of just wanting to blast our way to the summit. Well, strangely enough, Richard, the, 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 these stories came before the interest in getting to summits. Um, as a teenager, I would read the Scots magazine every month. I'd read... Can't be many teenagers who no, did that No, I think then. I was the only teenager in Scotland who had a subscription to the Scots magazine. My parents bought me it as a, as a birthday present because of the work of Tom Weir. 
Like, you know, the great um, the great television personality, the great mountaineer, the great ornithologist. He was so many things to so many different people. And he was a great mentor of mine. And I, I used to read Tom's stuff, and Tom was into all this stuff as well. Tom didn't just write about climbing mountains. He wrote about Scotland. He wrote about rural Scotland. He wrote about the countryside. And so I was interested in all these things. And it wasn't until I was um, in my late 20s um, that I became interested in, in, in Monroe bagging. And it was after reading Hamish Brown's book, Hamish, Hamish's Mountain Walk, where he did the first um, round of all the Monroes in one expedition. And that kind of fired me up to start climbing Monroes. I read that book and I had a, got on Monroe's table and I thought, I've climbed that, I've climbed that. And I climbed about 120 or something. So set out to actually climb all the Monroes then. So that came later. So this love of Scotland, if you like, has, has always been with me from as far back as I can remember. And, and really that's what I'm writing about. It's a basic love of this wee country of ours, um, its culture and its folklore, its history. Uh, and, and the mountains, are, they're just part of that. I actually think the book is a bit like a round of the Monroes because you almost it has a circular quality you start with that sense of what you can't do now we have this glorious journey and then you come back to, to that theme again um there's almost a sense of bereavement in that you can't do everything you once did although you still for your age you're phenomenally active um but how do you stay positive i think i stay positive because there's always things to do um, there's always new things to do, and now that I can't really backpack, you know, like my mate, who used to say, maybe just me, Chris Townsend, is still going and doing big multi-week walks across America and all the rest of it, and I'm really quite envious of him. Um, but I can't do that anymore because of, as, you know, as I say, various um, injuries and problems and stuff. But I can go out on my bike for several days at a time. I can ride my bike and, and, and you know, put my, my tent and my sleeping bag and all the rest into bags on the bike and, and go bike packing, to use these horrible terms. Um, but, you know, and, and that's great. And that's new and it's adventurous. Um, and is it a good substitute? Well, it's a substitute. Um, it doesn't take me on the high tops, but I've got a knee bike, a knee mountain bike. It does take me on the high tops. And, and, and that's been good. So there's always something new. I remember Hamish Brown saying to me many, many years ago, that when he got older and he, and he couldn't carry his own gear round the hills, he would buy a donkey and the donkey would carry the gear. Now, I don't know whether Amy's has ever done that, but you, know, you have to adapt. You have to adapt with age. And as you adapt with age, you find new challenges and new things to do. I don't think I'll ever um, you know, give up the, my, my, my love or, or, or lose my love of the wild places. But I can still get to these places and I can still take a great joy in wandering through a forest. I can still take great joys in, 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 in doing lowland routes. Um, and I think that's, that's really quite important. It's, it's, it's the, the, the adaption to these things that's, that's so important. Uh, Cameron, let's just finish. I mean, I think the book is full of fantastic and inspirational stories. Um, many of them struck a chord with me because... I've been with you on, on, on a lot of those journeys. I was particularly interested in what you had to say about Orkney and Shetland because I suspect that what you find up there came as a real surprise and as a revelation to you. Well, you'll know. You were there. I mean, you were directing the Bloomin' Films. You, you, you knew the thought processes I had at the time and I was saying, I love mountains. I love roaring waterfalls. I love pine forests. There's nothing like that here. What am I going to say about these places? It's, it's kind of flat and there's just lots of sea. But yet, there was something about these places that was different. There was a, a, a feeling of northness that you don't feel anywhere else, which, again, you know, quite often in my life, I've looked to the west as the kind of inspiring values of, of, of landscape and countryside. But northness is something peculiar in, in itself. Particularly if you remember, we went to North Ronaldsey, uh, and that, that was. Uh, and if you look at North Ronaldsey, if, if you put that island in, say, the Inner Hebrides, it really wouldn't be anything. It's just a big flat island. But because of this feeling of Orkney, because of the migrating birds, and because of a whole number of things, it's a very, very special place. 
and, and I think when we were there filming, it, it touched us all as a very, very special place. And I hope something of that special place came across in the, in, in the film that we did. Um, and I think, you know, in, in so many of these programmes that you and I did together, whether it's going to way back to the edge, uh, wilderness walks, uh, the stuff we did with the adventure show and Roads Less Travelled, you know, I think you'll agree that we met some really inspiring people. We, we managed to get to some really fabulous places that are well off the beaten track. Um, so it, it, in a sense, it's, it's those people and, and it's those places that I've tried to um, take values from and instill that value into this book, Come By The Hills. And really, in a sense, if I didn't call it Come By The Hills, um, Roads Less Travelled would have a great title because kind of that's what it's about. We're here on a glorious autumn day in the shadow of the Cairngorms where we both live. Um, plans for the future. I suspect there's a lot There's a lot you still want to do, a lot you still want to achieve. This book, which I think is absolutely fantastic, to me is, is just like a marker along the way of a journey that, that's by no means over. This book, Come By The Hills, is exclusively about Scotland. Um, and, I, and I'm associated with you know, through television and, and, and what I've written in the past you know, with Scotland. But there's so many other places I want to visit. Lots of places I have visited around the world. I've been very, very fortunate in, in, in my lifetime, in, in my career as an outdoor writer, um, to visit some of the most beautiful places in the world. But there's still lots of them I want to visit. And, and you know, we had huge plans for this year, but, you know, COVID-19 put paid to that. So we've had to sit still. Um, but, you know, live it, living here as we do in the shadow of the Cairn Gorms, it's actually not a bad place to, um, you know, just to hunk, hunker down and say, well, there's problems out in the world, but, you know, we're okay here. We can still go out and it's quite beautiful. But I still have lots of ambitions to, 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 to go to various countries in the world. To take my wife, Gina, and myself in our little camper van and go off for, um, you know, five or six weeks uh, around the Alps is one idea. Uh, we're desperate to spend part of the winter in Portugal. Um, lots, lots and lots of things. Um, you know, it's, 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 there's so much to do in one lifetime. And the problem is when you get to my age, you know, I'm in my 70s now. So you kind of think, I don't have the time to, to wait too long to do, you know, time becomes limited. You, you, this is the difference between older and younger. When you're younger in your 20s, you, you seem to think you've got eternity to do things. When you reach your 70s, you become very aware that um, you, you don't have that time any longer. Well, so on that squeeze as much as you can into a short time. Well, on that philosophical note, let me just say that whilst we're locked down or partially locked down, there's a lot worse things you can do than read Come By The Hills. Cameron, thanks very much indeed. Thank you, my pleasure. <laughs>